Hello and warm and welcome to episode 63 of SAP on Azure YouTube channel. Today is uh, October 14 and uh, Holger is not today with us on well-deserved vacation. Robert is very busy, so I'm here. And we have also an old, old guy, old kid on the block, Martin Pank Pankratz, again with uh, talking with us uh, about the, yes. some new cool block. Um, kind of Martin, you're already becoming a, as a part of furniture here, you know. So it's a, a default option. <laughs> and you know what they say, huh? when the big bosses are out there, the cats are dancing on the table. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. But it's always good to have you uh, here because I mean, love it. This uh, integration stuff, I learn a lot. I learn a lot, honestly, because I'm more infrastructure guy. But it's always, always, uh, I love your blogs. I love your blogs because they are very easy to digest, and I got really ideas what's possible to do it. You know, and that's that's the big help. Now, I would say uh, before we start with your part, right, uh, we will talk more, uh, you or you will present it more uh, on the topic of uh, .NET and how to speak to O data and how to also use the app services, why to use it, how to scale it to diff different topics, right? But before we basically start again, let's go through the looking back, what's news uh, on SAP on Azure last week and then then we will uh, continue with your part. So let me <clears throat> just quickly then share the desktop. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so basically very interesting uh, two events, <clears throat> two, uh, two conferences. Let's start with the one which comes first. It's Microsoft Ignite from November 2nd to the 4th. Um, Microsoft Ignite is basically um, <clears throat> something which is in the past called sub Microsoft TechEd. Yeah, it's really more for the IT guys. Again, I, I'm sure it's, I registered, it's what I can see is for free. Uh, so feel free to, to do it. Um, a lot of good session, they will surely be uh, available online afterwards. Um, I basically just quickly uh, scanned some SAP topic. So for now, I find the two reams, uh, what it means to run SAP workloads in Azure. Amit uh, uh, Ganguly, it's basically a PM man manager. Um, and uh, you see, it's probably opportunity to ask the question and tell them what, what basically you as a customer would love to uh, see and how that, uh, uh, the program management can be what it, they can do in order to improve the, uh, your ex SAP on Azure experience. Uh, interesting, another one as the Asperx. Uh, so there is a, a kind of uh, open open uh, table talk, interactive table talk. So again, of course, only if you are alive, you, you can participate. Otherwise, you will be able to watch, right? Um, another one, again, uh, SAP TechEd, you know, the technical part as well, uh, a little bit later, still November, but later 16 to 18. So it's not overlapping, overlapping with the Microsoft uh, part, which is good. Again, also checked uh, for some um, uh, for the some uh, topics. So I find one about the chatbot for S4 HANA Cloud. It's a, it's it's an SAP service, but interest, interesting here, which is related. It's also integration with uh, Fury app and well as with the Microsoft Teams. Yeah, so that that's a kind of interesting. There's a lot of happening on this. Uh, mutual integration between the SAP and Microsoft. So definitely will be an interesting. Another one would be also uh, uh, SAP success factor and integration to Microsoft Azure Active Directory. Obviously it's 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 an integration and out, uh, um, identity topic. Uh, two guys, uh, one it's uh, from SAP product management, one from the Microsoft, which makes sense, right? And the one which I really love it, I'm looking forward, uh, the Holger will actually be part of this from as a from Microsoft from PM's program program, program management side and Matthias Kleiner also from uh, SAP side. Um, it's about uh, a joint project between the Microsoft and Azure how to speed up and make it easier migration of uh, a non S4 HANA system to uh, S4 HANA uh, and directly to Azure, which basically simplify the whole procedure, right, and minimize the downtime. We already mentioned, uh, I believe, in the last uh, session, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, there will be a white paper, but this is really a, a cool opportunity also to join uh, to join the, um, uh, this, this track as well. 
Um, now on the other stuff, if you would look at, for example, uh, one interesting point, many things are happening about the Azure NetApp files. I pulled the Azure NetApp as an infrastructure component very much used by uh, by SAP uh, load as well. You can host SAP MNT file share, you can put the HANA there, for example, other databases like Oracle and so on and so on. Um, they are, uh, the Azure NetApp is continuously improving its feature. Uh, basically, these are the kind of feature which are related to the on, on the networking side, how to have more IP addresses, for example, to increase the IP limit, how to increase on this uh, network security part. Again, that that was uh, uh, there. There was some some limits. Um, so I, I would warmly welcome just just to take a look on it. And uh, surely uh, many of those points uh, will be uh, you will be possible to use it in your SAP on Azure project. Yeah. Uh, another kind of also uh, ANF Azure NetApp feature is the public preview of the uh, ANF backup capability. And that would be really interesting because, I mean, um, uh, uh, the story Azure NetApp is basically on the background is a, a NetApp functionality which comes with the on tap uh, software. And they have a, this snapshot technology where which can be used also for the backup and restore. And the good point is that you only save actually the delta from that, not the whole information, but only what is changed. And the idea is also to move uh, those snapshots easily uh, and fast in a cost effective Azure blob storage and restore it as well. So um, it's a public preview. Um, will be interesting also to see what does that mean for the SAP, especially uh, also for the databases. But again, it's a public preview feature. And I mean, partners and customer, of course, uh, very uh, welcome uh, to try it. Uh, Azure zones uh, are continuously uh, are being asked from the customer for the kind of improved HA, or even somebody would use a kind of DR. So Azure zones are two data centers in one region. They are not always available in all the region now, and, and this kind of limits is being continuously expanded. Uh, uh, so as an example, South Africa, North now have the zones. Uh, uh, Korea Central has also zones generally available. So basically, uh, yeah, many, the region which are lacking this uh, zone feature is being enriched continuously. So you can also expect it in other regions as well. And that's not, not uh, surprisingly because uh, many, even SAP customer, what I also experienced, they lo look more for the zones than for the availability set constructs. Um, so talking about the zones, um, last week we touched, there's an announcement of um, uh, Windows clustering for central services in the zones powered by Azure Files SMB. Um, so we mentioned this in the past, it is, it is available. Uh, Azure Files SMB is a zonal redundant, right? So you have an out of the box HA functionality um, uh, which is uh, zonal redundant. Now, with Windows clustering, you have a two ways how to handle uh, or two varieties for the central service. One is the file share, uh, and in this case, file share is Azure files for SMB. Another option is the the uh, Azure shared disk, and this is uh, what just kind of. Um, Yesterday, two days ago, it's basically updated in in the in the um, kind of in the documentation of the of the official SAP on Azure documentation. So I'm just here, kind of looking for the zones, and you will get uh, a shared disk is or was being uh, supported uh, in the past, but only with the in the, as a local available storage in a connection with the availability set. And the news is that the same idea is basically just expanded to the zones. So now you can use a zonal, so-called zonal redundant shared disk as well. Uh, we're talking about the premium disk uh, in the availability zones. Um, they are premium disk, again, they are, um, they are SSD, as, uh, uh, they are, I would say, uh, good enough for the sub m file share, definitely. Um, now there's also some consideration which is also mentioned in documentation so to say uh, for example um, the zrs has a, some higher a bit it 
expectation some uh, storage latency a bit higher than local redundant storage because the uh, there's a cross-zonal copy of the data but still those copies are synchronous so meaning uh, when we talk about the file share it's really uh, rpo equal to zero there is no loss of the data so only when the third one is stored uh, in the third zone then it's committed uh, now of course because that zonal distance it's it's much bigger um, or it's bigger than the local distance there there could be some penalties on a, uh, on a storage latency uh, and there is also what what it's in, interesting that uh, distance between the availability zones uh, is different so meaning a latency in one region when you have a zone of the zonal redundant shared disk uh, could be higher than the latency of uh, zonal redundant shared disk in another region because in that region maybe the distance is smaller right between them so you just need to kind of uh, um, try it and test it um, very kind of also interesting is because this is already existing kind of uh, from I mean the whole idea and concept is introduced um, uh, with the local redundant shared disk and um, if you already the only difference is basically uh, here let's say uh, PowerShell is used uh, as, a, as a mean to create it in the past was a uh, specify a premium L LRS meaning local redundant shared disk and now it's premium ZRS zonal redundant shared disk and so that's the only difference of course the VMs needs to be a uh, kind of uh, zonal redundant as well but Honestly, here you have a full H zonal HA of subcentral services on Windows uh, with 99.99% of availability. And by the way, uh, it's also one interesting question. Somebody was asking why would um, why should you use uh, the the uh, file share approach or the shared disk approach? I mean, maybe one some argumentation here could be the uh, shared disk approach and generally speaking with SAP it's supported with 7.0 and higher which means uh, 7.0 and higher kernel uh, meaning um, all SAP versions uh, are supported uh, with the shared disk and uh, file share approach generally speaking is also supported from SAP with 7.49 kernel meaning a bit newer product uh, newer product or middle or newer newer later product so if you would have some even older product um, in Azure with a lower kernel version then the shared disk would be a good way to go uh, now also basically jumping back to uh, Martin and uh, jumping back from a low level integration of SAP on Azure to a kind of higher spheres we come to the really nice I read the blog really nice blog on uh, .net, .net um, uh, integration here how to use with the Azure app service how and why to use Azure AP management so I would say um, Martin maybe back to you <laughs> yeah thank you very much Goran for the introduction um the the we, we uh, Martin Reppel and I we are working on this topic together and um we um like distributed uh, some of the, the efforts between us. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I focused on the um, actual integration yeah, with, with the client and uh, making sure that we have connectivity and understand how we work with uh, all data feeds that are published on the NetViewer gateway and integrate that into an API management layer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his part, uh, he's focusing on the principal propagation. Yeah? So he has this very long block series covering all the different aspects and he will also add that one as well uh, as the um, the hybrid component of that. Yeah? I will give some more info, so that means a little later. So we expect uh, another post um, regarding this topic, completing like the cycle of it. And that's why I mentioned in, at the beginning, it's a duet yeah? mm -hmm. consisting of two, two parts. OK, so with this one, um, I'd like to quickly share my whiteboard. Sure. So Great to do it. Introduce, introduce the topic. So let me grab the screen from you, but not this one, the other one. Yeah, it's, uh, I see some coding. We're not Postman. there yet. Wrong screen. 
next one. Okay, there we go. Okay, the dashboard is there, visible. Whiteboard, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So when I divide this into three parts, so on the left, I'd say this is uh, my 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 own subscription, my so to say my custom subscription in Azure, and on the right there would be uh, BTP on on Azure, yeah. So SAP's business technology platform. So basically, it's an again SAP cloud service powered by underlying Azure infrastructure. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. SAP runs BTP on hyperscalers, yeah. And exactly, yeah. And they, of course, they should choose to run on Azure, right? <laughs> well, this, this, uh, it's in native if it's natural. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, uh, customers have two options. Um, mm -hmm. They can either deploy SAP's uh, implementation of an API management solution, and this is uh, part of a bundle. Um, nowadays, they call this integration suite, mm -hmm. um, where you get API management plus um, the like a process integration uh, middleware where you orchestrate flows, transform messages, and stuff like that. So you get the two components to achieve uh, integration. Yeah, and that's also available on Azure. And um, this is described also very well. We have um, there's their blog series how to get this done with uh, also with Azure AD integration and uh, aspects of principal propagation. And since this is already covered a lot, yeah, and quite well described, um, we are also we're closing the gap, um, doing the same with the Azure tool set, yeah, and maybe um, having some specifics that are that are great about doing that on Azure. Yeah. So we have a slightly different icon for that, yeah. So. That's uh, our API management solution. Which is um, natively available and um, you could say this is like a past past component. Yeah? So with its own set of SLAs and um, um, components that you can configure there. And what's great about it, um, you can actually integrate it with your VNets yeah? because your SAP is usually on a private VNet. Right. Yeah, so that could be the ECC, yeah, or the S4, or PIPO, yeah, so really doesn't matter, yeah, what, what that component is. So that would mean uh, we have a, a security. There is nothing going pub publicly, right? Exactly. If, if you need, uh, that's an A, and uh, I guess another part would be also an excellent performance because in Microsoft Backend, Still, which is not the public network, right? I would assume it. Exactly, yeah. So once you you reach the Microsoft network, you you can profit from that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And our API management offers you multiple modes of operation. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of them being external. Yeah, and if it's external, so it's actually on the boundary of the VNet. It mm -hmm. can be internet facing, but also have visibility behind. Yeah, to mm -hmm. to your private okay. VNet. Okay. But it can it can also be internal only, yeah. So it can only be reached privately and has no no access from from the outside world. Yeah? Okay, and customer can choose it, of course, depending on their needs. Exactly, exactly. And a very common pattern then is to um, have a gateway component here on the boundary, and, yeah, which could be then our app gateway, mm -hmm. um, to have a manage uh, entry points into the private VNet, also with web application firewalls. Yeah? And we had a session a couple of weeks ago with Christoph Klassens, yeah, who introduced right. us to some yeah. WAF rules. Yeah, yeah. So this would be a typical setup where um, this is your internet facing entry point with a very secure setup yeah? and an internal only published API management solution. Mm -hmm. And um, why is it even interesting? Yeah, SAP offers a lot of APIs on their on their backend systems, and very often companies don't only have SAP offering APIs. Yeah, there are also other systems yeah, that mm -hmm. offer interesting entry points there yeah, you, where you want to interact with. And um, an API management gives you the the opportunity to consolidate those different 
uh, sources into one place and govern them from one place. Yeah. Okay, that's one of the like the, the major um, uh, features that you get. Yeah. And the number one for um, exposing your 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 like very critical system. Yeah. For instance, during very critical times like financial closing. Yeah. That's a sensitive. Uh, decision, yeah, and you need to make sure that um, it cannot be overloaded with any any unexpected uh, loads, yeah. And as soon as you give access to other like parties or clients, yeah, do you reach a certain level of uncertainty, yeah? Because you cannot tell when they're going to ask uh, questions yeah, to your backend through through the services, okay. Especially uh, if they get interested during financial closing in certain certain data yeah, that you were not anticipating before. Yeah. Which could influence the overall system performance, right? Exactly. If suddenly yeah. 100 people are getting interested because someone posted uh, like there's something wrong with it yeah, and then they start asking it, yeah, the system that might might have an impact. Yeah, Just yeah. one one example. Yeah. And then such an API management solution gives you uh, like a critical feature, which is called throttling. Yeah. So there's okay. native there's native support uh, to avoid overload. Yeah, so you can have a policy that says, okay, once we have more than 500 requests per minute, just making some numbers up, make sure that you start dropping requests yeah, so that we don't exceed this threshold. Ah, yeah? that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So okay. you need to come up with a rule of thumb how much you can tolerate. Yeah, and everything above that you might consider dropping or delaying the answers. Yeah. OK, so basically you are that kind of front end components. It's kind of protecting the back end system, so to say, from overall overload. Yes, right. so that's okay. one of the, the major reasons why yeah. you would introduce an API management solution in the mix. OK, yeah. all right. So to consolidate your different API needs and also um, some um, protective needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so in our case, uh, we are interacting with a Odata gateway. Yeah, so let me put this on a separate box. All data gateway, NetWeaver gateway. There's like multiple names, and I always uh, right. get asked to to put the new name, but I always keep forgetting which one it is nowadays. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, it's a NetWeaver component which sit in front of the SAP system, right, and expose the exactly uh, yeah. yeah the API through the old data service. Okay. Yeah, usually you have it separately, but you could also have it on the same system. Yeah, it's only a matter of activating on the NetWeaver stack. Yeah, but usually in productive environments, uh, it's put separately. Yeah, so it can be treated separately, patched differently, uh, have has just have this has a different life cycle yeah, than the okay. ERP maybe. Yeah, right. Okay, and so we are interacting through API management directly with the exposed services there. Yeah. Yeah. And what you will see. Uh, during Martin Repl's session, yeah, when he shows this, there's also the opportunity to bring this. Can I copy? No, I can't. Then let me. Maybe the whole. Uh, yeah. Let me move it here. There's the, the possibility um, to have a replication of the same API management instance also on premises. Ah, OK. OK, interesting. Yeah, on premises. Yeah, so access are, from on premises, it can be on premise. I mean, it's in Azure, but maybe access from the yeah. on premises. OK. Let me maybe make a drawing here of the, which is as beautiful as the actual picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, so would the copy paste work here? <laughs> I, yeah, probably it would. Probably it try. Would. So copy, paste. Paste now. No, I need to no, learn no. the new okay. whiteboard on Windows 11. All right. No problem. <laughs> so, so there is a relationship between those two here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, since we are executing on our hybrid story yeah, with um, Azure Arc, it's called, yeah, there's the possibility to have a replica of the same instance uh, in a near on premise environment. And this actually runs on uh, Kubernetes. Yeah? So the that's the, the ah, how, this is, okay. how this is possible. This is how this okay. is possible. Yeah? Okay, so okay, there's a managed okay. environment. 
and we have a description on that and Martin Rappler will show you some, some more So details meaning the, the, the uh, Azure API managed service is running in Kubernetes in on on-premise environment. So basically through the Kubernetes, you could deploy it somehow in the on-premise world. Exactly. Is that, exactly. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. And the servers are interconnected. So I can maintain the APIs in my Azure portal environment mm -hmm. and it would automatically uh, publish the changes also to on-premises. And the okay. nice thing about this is now that any client that runs on on premises and has the need to reach a whatever a SQL for instance on premises. Okay now I'm getting delays for my for my boxes. There it goes. I can actually go to my Azure API management here and don't have to go back to the cloud. Yeah because yeah. it can it can stay here. Yeah which okay. immediately simplifies um, the the whole consolidation efforts. Yeah? I don't have to distinguish between APIs that are on premises and stay on premises and the ones that are enabled in the cloud. Yeah? Which is a very nice, uh, very nice way, a very nice feature for these hybrid um, okay. opportunity. You know? Okay, so far so good. So far on the theory, now let's have a quick look on the uh, on the blog. I probably have to open here. There we go. And I need to change the screen that I'm sharing. Screen one. There we go. Yeah, exactly. So I've seen you give a different uh, architectural examples depending of what you what the customer might want to achieve right which is kind of interesting yeah um so in, in that case also azure AP, uh, maybe if you like i don't know maybe not i mean the guys like me are <laughs> they're more in, in in the background in the low level stuff you know so um uh, these are kind of high level integration stories maybe just you say quickly uh, what is azure app service for example, mm -hmm. what could be used in in the context? Okay, some user. So what what what's that? Mm -hmm. So far we use we motivated API management, but of course you uh, you want to have a client actually using it. Yeah, correct. And yeah. Uh, one popular uh, option is our platform as a service um, offering for uh, running applications, and the Azure App Service is basically the the, the scaffolding where you can execute. Uh, typical um, front ends, back ends, anything that comprises an app. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and that would be uh, possible for uh, the usual uh, programming language like Java, Node.js. Uh, there's also PHP for more seasoned people. And Maybe. it's uh, like the typical programming languages that are. Right. Yeah. And C sharp in your example. Oh, for example, OK, it depends if they would use the .NET, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. okay. it's a frame, it's a framework C sharp, the programming yeah. language. Exactly. And um, since uh, we wanted to um, show some uh, like possibilities on with Azure native tooling, uh, we we chose uh, Azure App Surface. But of course, it could also be uh, BTP uh, Cloud Foundry based applications yeah? mm -hmm. consuming this. Yeah? Now, for me, it was one interesting point. The Azure App Service accepts the Azure API management service, and Azure API management goes to the O data. Um, uh, but mm -hmm. basically, you could go Azure App Service could go directly to SAP O data uh, gateway, right? Because it's all O data protocol, right? Exactly. So there, there is surely some reason why you introduce here Azure API management service in between yeah, I believe. Like, yeah yeah like we said before yeah that uh, it's about the, the throttling opportunity mm -hmm. and um, consolidation and the governance of those apis yeah? because usually it's not only sap that you have yeah? you have right. most of the time you have many many apis that you want to want to govern them yeah? but for this critical workload you really want to be um, you really want to put all the, the the means that you have to secure this yeah? So then I make make a difference between um, very lockdown 
uh, architectures. Like I called this one the Fort Knox, yeah, where everything is kept private and you can't go into the private VNet only if you connect via VPN or the express route. So the app service is private, no internet connection. The API management is private, no internet connection, and DSAP, of course. Yeah. Right. And from on premise to the yeah, Azure through the VPN by default is secured. Nothing goes through the uh, any kind of public interfaces. So okay. Exactly. And, and that could be also. I mean, I would definitely imagine an SAP contact because um, a valid scenario. Uh, as we also have a kind of prerequisite, Azure is an ext network extension of the on-premise world. They are accessing from the on-premise clients to the SAP. They want to do in or have to do in a secure way, and then VPN is the way. So that would be definitely a valid scenario, and nothing is kind of open on outside world, right? Uh, if, if you want it that yeah. way. Yeah. If you wanted that, yeah, yeah. And um, like I said before, you can choose. Yeah, if you see the screen from the portal where you have to configure if it's internal or external facing, yeah? And if you choose it to be external, um, then um, the API management is also um, having a public IP address, yeah? And be as mm -hmm. reachable from, from the internet, yeah? And, yeah. So, the re so basically here on this third example, you have a hybrid, right? You have internal coming mm -hmm. from the left, from the on-premise through the VPN, and you have also external going through the Azure App Gateway, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. And they would access the same Azure API uh, um, management uh, connection, right? An instance, exactly. so to say. Yeah, because in many cases, um, you have different um, requirements yeah, for your, for your APIs. And for some, we see at customers, they say, well, they need to be accessible internally. But for this selected list of APIs, we want them also to be reachable from external, yeah? okay. but in a secure secure way. Yeah? And uh, connectivity-wise, like I drew before when we did the, the theory on the whiteboard, um, one way of achieving this is by um, putting a, a gateway component on the, on the VNet boundary um, so that you can also have WAF uh, web application firewall um, okay. To take care of your um, of the security on the boundary here. Yeah. So would that be a better way or the only way? I mean, could you place instead of uh, um, uh, Azure App Gateway the uh, Azure App Service instead? Um, well, the the App Service is only really a um, a front end that consumes. Yeah, the the, the gateway is opening uh, connectivity. Yeah, into okay. the Okay. 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 Yeah. Here you could consider having the API management uh, being directly internet facing. Yeah? So you can do that, but then you're missing the web application firewall. Right. And in this mixed scenario, you would actually need a second instance even, yeah, because you cannot configure one API management to be both at the same both. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. security yeah. part. Yeah. It's, it's as either external or internal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. want to achieve something like this, you need uh, another gateway component yeah? to make sure that you can have this in one instance. Yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the OData service, how do we expose it to the API management? I made a description here how to do it with uh, a backend transaction. Uh, there's the gateway client, so you can do it on the sub-GUI if you want. But there's really multiple ways. Yeah? We really only need the, the metadata description of that OData service, so we can continue working with it. And for the purpose of the demo, um, we're going to add a new service into the API management solution. And at this point, um, let's send the request. So here I'm getting the description for this gateway sample basic service that's available in every single system. So it doesn't matter. Every EC reasonably new ECC and S4, they have the service. You can activate it. It comes as part of the installation. And um, here we get the description. And I'm simply copying it. And when we go into the Azure portal, here's my API management instance. Okay, still need to delete it because we're going to add a new one. So here we have a couple of options to create from a new definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are going to choose the one with open API. So at this point, 
um, we have the need to convert yeah, from metadata XML to open API. Okay. And for that one, we are actually providing a web-based converter. This is a website that uses um, a public um, conversion repository. So the Oasis committee, they published a uh, Node.js-based yeah. okay. um, library that you can use to make the conversion. Yeah, and we are only putting a front end on top of that. Yeah? So if I now put now what I copied before, yeah, so I put my description in here, I'm converting it live. Now I can uh, download the changed. I can either do this to the clipboard or download the okay. file. So I'm getting the download. Okay, seems like it's a slow process at the moment. We can speed it up late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I get an error message? Let's quickly check. It's going to be very slow at the moment. Uh, um, no, it's not, it's not an error message from there. Also need here. Okay, so maybe then I'm going you to need just a file. Okay, I'm just going to copy and uh, create the file myself. Yeah. Yeah. And pasting the code. Okay. Okay. There we go. So I'm saving that. We're going back here, and now we're going to create it from the open API definition. There we go, open API. So now so you're that's... loading all data definition from SAP, right? Yes. Okay. So, and then I can decide if I want to put my own suffix here. There could be something like, I don't know, something to identify this, mm -hmm. but in my case, I'm going to do exactly the same. Ah, okay. Okay, as the SAPs. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, yeah. mapping them mm -hmm. there. Okay, so basically it wouldn't be any differences between accessing the Azure API or SAP Gateway, so to say in a way to do it. Yeah, exactly. So this, this, um, um, it makes it sometimes easier yeah, for the people developing the Fiori apps or if they right. know the services. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah because yeah. there's a one-to-one -one relationship between yeah. them. Yeah. So then we can hit create. This gets us all the operations in here. Yeah, you see there's the long list of things that you might have done manually then or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the one we're going to test with is the product set. And you see there's also the or data specific query parameters, everything already added. Yeah, cool. some response mm -hmm. all generated out of the box. Yeah. And since I didn't provide my uh, on the converter, my individual um, service parameters, yeah, we offered to, to do that here on the optional parameters. Um, but if you don't want to provide this on a public um, internet website, uh, even though we uh, we promise that nothing gets saved, yeah, then you will keep those um, dummy values here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you don't want that, I mean, you can change it either on the on the file or then do it here for the okay. for the web service, which we are going to do right now. Yeah. So this is now the actual target, yeah, because the app management has the visibility yeah. of the of my VNet and can reach the the VM which runs the SAP system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to save that. And since the metadata XML doesn't contain a specific operation for the metadata, we need to 
add that. I'm looking to uh, simplify that going forward. So either add that to the, to the coding library that's added automatically, yeah. Or we uh, think about enhancing the, the API management anyways. Yeah? So at this point, we would add the operation here. That's all described in the block in, in detail, yeah, for how do you do that for the operations. But now we actually have the um, reached uh, functionality of the service. Yeah? Okay. So now we can either test from here or from an external tool. Yeah? I'm going to copy the test array from here, and we're going to do the test from Postman. Mm -hmm. Do we have the domain of the API management solution? In my case, it's uh, External facing, yeah, so it's facing the internet. <coughs> and um, we have the URL that's targeting the private uh, VNet where the VM runs, which has no internet access. Yeah? <coughs> and now it's complaining because I don't provide my subscription key. For the sake of the, of the demo, I'm just going to deactivate the, the subscription key, but this is a concept that you have also in the API management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to distinguish between the access rights. Yeah. And then I'm going to need the authorization. And in our case, I'm going to achieve that by putting it um, under this collection, which already has my user credentials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This collection uh, maintains the the basic out that I'm using for the for the actual test call. Yeah? And there we go. Okay. We get okay. we get the metadata mm -hmm. from the service, and we can actually start using it completely. Yeah. So the product set is one of the entities. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. I say uh, the top ten values. I start seeing the products here. Huh? So we get some files and binders and everything here. Yeah? So we now exposed one API yeah? in a, and have it now in our Azure API management. Okay, but so if we now progress in the, in the blog post, so we were able to expose an API. What's, what's next? Yeah? Consuming it from another, from another client, yeah, and like we did it said at the beginning, the app service would be a good way of doing that. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. So the app service I have here. So let's open it again on a private window. This is my app service URL, which sends me to my. Um, my login for for Azure AD. So Azure AD would authenticate you and yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. And this is now going to one of the uh, data services that I already put there, which is yep. the the product okay. services. Yeah. And uh, what's nice about this one, this is actually using principal propagation. Mm -hmm. Meaning the the Azure ID user, which was the is this one, the best run mpancards at best run corp on Microsoft.com, is being mapped to my backend user. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we see the the product data is exposed. You can start working in in, in your UI. Yeah. You can start oh, editing. Cool. Aspects aspect of it yeah so nice. everything you would expect to be able cool. to do here okay so basically you are having pub you're publicly accessing this publicly but you are still uh through the say h is https you are also authenticated through the azure ad mm -hmm. so only you if you as a user can do it okay you can access it then the information on uh from the backend part okay cool Exactly, yeah. So that's the two layers that we always discuss. Yeah, um, having Azure AD to make sure that the user is um, the the person he who he claims he is. Yeah, 
and um, then you have the opportunity to put multifactor or conditional access. Exactly, yeah, yeah with all the beauty yeah, of the security, front end exactly. security part. Yeah. Exactly. And that really doesn't matter if you do that uh, internally in, in Azure private VNets who are locked down or if you do that with parts that are exposed. Yeah, but if they're exposed to the internet, it becomes increasingly important yeah, that you have mm -hmm. features like this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I said principle propagation. Yeah. So this this user is mapped to my backend user. Yeah. And um, you can see here, this is the uh, SU01 uh, yeah, transaction. Okay. For, so actually, um, here you see there's my email address, so I'm getting mapped through that. And on the SAP backend, I'm John Doe. Yeah. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Martin Repler's uh, favorite uh, test test user always, yeah, John Doe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and let's have a quick look before we finish this um, on that specific uh, how the principle propagation uh, there looks like. Yeah? Martin Rappler will give the, the, the will close the topic on that one, but I'm going to give you a, a quick overview. So the API that the app service uses that, that we saw before is this one, SAP EPM products, and it actually goes to this EPM Ref apps product and service, which is also one of the standard services that you get on SAP's cloud-based uh, demo system ES5 or with any other uh, fresh install system, you can activate this one. Yeah? Okay. So, <clears throat> and when we check our policies, yeah, so we have here the operations, and then the, the flow goes from left to, to right. Yeah, before you reach the backend, before you send the request, you have to have the opportunity to put in a policy. Mm -hmm. Let me make this bigger so that we can actually look at this properly. So I hope you this is now better visible. No, it's it's um, yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. So in here you have a description of a policy, and there's also the the snippet section where you can get uh, some predefined uh, oh, snippets okay. for tip for typical use cases that you had here. Yeah? Okay. How to get a value from a from from a cache, yeah? store items to make it easier yeah? to put in the to correct policies. And we have uh, like a policy library as well, yeah, in our docs, um, where you can uh, look up the typical um, policies yeah, that customers apply for various use cases. For this particular one, we start with validating the JOT token. And this is uh, the first step that you need to um, need to take yeah, when you do the principal propagation. You need to verify that the uh, the client is sending you an Azure AD um, okay. authenticated uh, token, yeah. And there's a, like a process around this, if how to take, check the audience of this uh, token and who issued it actually. Cool. And, mm -hmm. and we have described this whole thing um, uh, quite quite uh, thoroughly to make sure that um, the process to configure something like this is very easy. And then you have to set a couple of variables. And in here you find the caching logic, meaning you solve the the complexity of the principle propagation, yeah, you know, sending the right tokens to the right request URLs, and actually solve that in only one place, yeah, only in the API management layer, and not for every single client that has the desire to consume this. Yeah? Okay, yeah. So basically, you don't have to, you do it once and that's it. You don't have to re repeat that procedure every time when there is a request, meaning exactly. the, the, the whole uh, access will be faster, right? Because at least that part of authentication you already did it once and that's it, period, right? No yeah, need to repeat exactly. it, okay. Also the efforts on the developer side, yeah? Every client that you develop now can is lifted off the burden to think about how do I cache the tokens? Uh, how do I uh, map the user? How, how does this all work? They only yeah. they only need to provide the Azure AD token, yeah, and have the app registration configured in a way mm -hmm. that they trust each other, yeah, and that really is a, um, a great simplification, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that definitely, yeah. Okay, 
so far so good on the on the policy here. And one of the things uh, that Holger always likes, yeah, since he's very much into the power platform. Yeah, that's his baby. Yeah, you, from here, from this API. Ah, okay, okay. You can say, I want this API, which does the principal propagation. Uh, I want this to be a power platform connector. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so okay. we can even um, scale the approach yeah, also to, to the power platform. Cool, nice. Okay, so far so good. So we saw the uh, architecture view of this. We motivated um, why you would introduce an API management yeah, to protect your backend system and how you would um, expose the adapter services yeah, to, to the API management. So the, the conversion there, yeah, which is at the moment still there. And different aspects of this, yeah. Private VNet integration, hybrid mode, yeah, to have this extended to, to the to on premises even. And uh, how to enable other clients yeah, within the Azure ecosystem or in your cloud ecosystem to consume through again, through one central instance the API management. Right. But then it's also come, I mean, in your blog later, it's, you're, you're starting to talk about um, uh, global or data reach, right? And how how if if, if the I mean, which is it's it's it can happen that uh, clients accessing are from a different continents, from a different geographical regions, right? You're absolutely right. I almost forgot. So let me scroll down a little. There we go. Yeah. Um. Since we we can easily distribute our API management instance, yeah, this is really this is a portal experience. Yeah? You can can go there, and no, not not this one. You have to open here. Reset. So on my API management instance. I can say where 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 are my locations, yeah? and here I can start adding based on my 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 demand. Yeah? So at the moment I have this in North Europe, but I could okay. start adding this in any uh, Azure region. Yeah? So there could be Australia, Brazil, America, South Africa. So they will be just yeah? cloned with whatever you configure it. They will be just cloned in a different location without you being needed to do anything else. Just telling deploy me in that another region right okay exactly exactly now you maintain it in one place and it gets populated to the others cool. okay and this really then enables here this this kind of architecture yeah, where you make sure that the user gets a, a quick way yeah to the to consume that adapter service no matter where he, are, where he is yeah. so in this case i deployed um one in australia east the US that I had before and US East, yeah. So really across across the world, yeah. And if you would then add a global routing solution in front of the, the app services, the users consuming this will then be automatically routed to the closest uh, instance to them. Yeah. And the Azure Front Door also um, gives you the opportunity to go into the Microsoft backbone as close as possible. Yeah. So we have a large network of uh, points of presences uh, across the world. Um, so if you're in North America, you really go quickly into the Microsoft network and then will be routed to uh, US East next year. Yeah. Right, which is closer, meaning your latency is lower, it will be faster. So you reach that uh, Azure API management spot in the, let's say, in the US East, but then you still have to travel. It has to connect to the uh, SAP O data service in the European, for example, um, region where it's located. But then, exactly. if uh, because you're using here, they're in a different VNets, you can create a VNet peering, and then still it will be used the Microsoft backend, meaning it will not go through the public way, which is a basically slower, slower. Uh, so in still way, in, in, in a way, it will be uh, actually optimized, opti opt optimized for the um, good networking performance, the best you can get it, so to say. 
better exactly. than if you would go it from the uh, North America across the public uh, uh, internet, and then you you are reaching uh, Azure API service inside of the Europe, for example. It's it's just a slower, it's just a slower, yeah. Yeah, that's what I put here an icon and roll next to it. Yeah. yeah, so to yeah. to motivate that you connect those, yeah, and then you get there. This also means if US East gets into trouble for whatever reason, um, North American users would just be routed to the next best fit, yeah, which could then okay. be the US. Oh, I love it. Yeah. High availability, that's nice. Exactly. But then <laughs> still, the SAP needs to be also highly available. Otherwise, yeah, that's another happen. piece of coin. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. agree. <laughs> agree. That's still cool. Okay. Exactly. But it's really great to just, you can put this closer to the end users just by adding items yeah, here on the locations list. Yeah. Cool. I think then we reached to the end of your blog, if I'm not, not um, yeah, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, I mean, I, I actually, I, honestly, I, I, I learn a lot. I learn a lot, you know, I just figure it out why, um, okay, Azure App Services is always interesting as a, as a concept in easy to create some kind of um, a pass application, so to say. Um, and all also the way how you can use Azure API Management A for consolidation, as you mentioned, for the security, uh, for the caching, caching of, of, of those authentication in order to, to speed it up and how to scale it actually across the, if you have a global reach, how, how to scale it and in, in make sure to have a, a the best performance. And again, my beloved topic of high availability, <laughs> right? Good. Cool. Cool. Well, my customers um, make the journey into becoming more API-driven right. companies. I, yeah. I, yeah. I'm just wondering. I mean, I know you are also working with the customers, so to say, SAP or Azure customer in this space. Uh, um, uh, do Do you see also they are kind of uh, work, work? I mean, this is a separate topic, so to say. Uh, API management, consolidation, you know, security, make it easy for clients to access certain functionality through the API. So what, what do you see on a, on, a, on a real customer world when I say Pionezure here? Well, we touched today um, the data piece, yeah? but we also see a uh, demand for, for REST services. Yeah? So which is okay. like, um, well, data is uh, REST services with some cleverness yeah? where you have some okay. logic built into it, yeah? um, but uh, not all the, the um, services that you have at your company not all of them are database. Yeah? So we have this in Dynamics, we have this in, in SAP, and there's a couple of others who adopted the uh, standard of OData. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But that you don't have that always. Yeah? So we have the need to incorporate those as well. Yeah? But that's native support anyways. Yeah? What we showed today is how you get closer to the SAP of way of doing things. Yeah? And everything else is already covered. Yeah? Right, yeah. And you mentioned also the Martin Reple will also have a, another part. I, I believe we are still waiting for this blog, right? If I'm exactly. not wrong. Okay, yeah. okay. So let's, so he just summarize. So he would cover which part? He uh, would uh, cover the whole setup that's necessary for the principal propagation. I showed today the policy, but didn't mm -hmm. tell much details yeah, about how, how you, okay. Okay. what's important there. So you saw it's already working. But the the theory around it, um, he's oh, okay. still uh, right. compiling, yeah, and the the hybrid part, yeah, deploy it on Kubernetes on on premises ah, and exactly. see, see yeah, it yeah, working yeah. from what's cool. from. I the, mean that's also interesting. So I, then I, I would assume that or suppose that the whole uh, Kubernetes is also in the background in the in the Azure itself. I mean as 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 a power, powering ba basically the the whole uh, concept of Azure API management service, right? Yeah. Which, I think in, in our prototype, yeah. he's, de he's deploying it on his own laptop. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so okay. it's Kubernetes on his laptop, uh, but it's the same, yeah, it's the same okay. as it would, you would do in on-premises. Yeah? Right, right. Okay, cool, cool. So look, look yeah, basically we, we, we need to, uh, yeah, we need to wait for the, his, uh, his part of the blog and they'll make a second, uh, second part of the of the story, make it round. Cool, yeah, cool. Exactly, make a complete picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
Great. So, Martin, I mean, that was, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned, I always learn a lot on the fly, you know, so in, in this space, but it's really a um, unlimited functionality, a uh, possibility, so to say, and, and flexibility. This is nice, you know, flexibility, availability, security. Uh, yeah, love it. <laughs> I, I love the world. So, my pleasure. Let's, yeah, let's continue. Marty next time and and really thanks a lot for for uh, coming back becoming a part of furniture here on SAP <laughs> on your YouTube channel yeah so that would be I believe for the everything for this time uh, guys thanks a lot and um, talk to you to everybody to the audience next time yeah bye bye bye